One of the reasons that people are so arrogant that the dollar status is not in jeopardy and so that we can keep on running these huge deficits, we can cre keep on creating inflation and the world's got no choice, right, but to stick with the dollar because are they going to go to the euro? Are they going to go to the yen? You know, the pound? I mean, the renminbi. I agree. All of those currencies also have problems. And so do you really want to switch from one flawed fiat currency to another, even if those other fiat currencies may be less flawed than the dollar, right? Do you really want to make that shift? I don't think that that's what's going to happen. What everybody is missing is that there is an alternative to the dollar that doesn't involve another fiat currency, and that's gold. That is real money. Everybody forgets that for thousands of years, gold was money. It was money because it worked. Gold is a symbol of wealth and status that's lasted for centuries, associated with all things luxurious, from jewelry to sports cars to even high-end dining. It's one of the most beloved and influential commodities that exists in our market today. Gold is unique in that it's both a commodity and a currency. So some um, investors will hold it purely as a financial asset and others may hold it in jewelry form so it can be enjoyed, but also it's a way of storing wealth as well. Coming up today, gold hits an all time high, oil breaking out again after Israel bombs an Iran embassy and Ukraine shooting down Russian drones, but in unexpected manufacturing data, rising bond yields, the Trump show continues and what everybody's favorite billionaire sees on the horizon. And welcome back everybody to the first trading day of the second quarter of this year. And it was actually a pretty interesting day. We've got some key developments I would like to share with you. Some interesting things happen in the commodity and bond markets today. And just before we get into all of that, just want to quickly say a huge thank you to everybody who took advantage of my Easter special. Over the long weekend, not only did you get yourself a great deal, you're also helping to support me and my efforts with this channel. So I really appreciate that. And for those of you who missed my last video I posted on Sunday, I actually shared the stock I gave out to paid members in early November. It's a small little profitable REIT in the cannabis space, paying over an 8% dividend yield. My fundamental indicators were showing it as undervalued. And as I promised back then, I would share the in-depth presentation once the stock was up 50%. And here we are a little over four months later, it's up 50%. So I do a really long 50 minute deep dive video into this one. If you're interested in watching that, stay to the end of this video and there'll be a link to that if you're interested in watching it. And I've had a few people reach out to me saying they were away over the weekend. They missed out on my special, which is now closed. I have a few send me an email to support at clickcapital.io. I can take in any late orders for the next day only. That's my course and indicators for $339 one-time fee. Okay, just getting on with the daily review. Obviously the S&P 500 stock market still in this kind of low range, low volatility up grinding mode. Underneath the hood, you wouldn't think it, but we've got inflation expectations as measured by the spread between inflation protected treasuries versus regular treasuries and uptrends on all time frames above the 5, 20, 50 and 200 day moving averages. We've also got the growth versus value, stock spread and high yield bonds now underneath their 5 20 and 50 day moving averages as well and just looking at sectors today coming out front semiconductors gold miners communications energy oil and gas and losing regionals REITs software home builders and small caps so looking at the sector performance today the markets reacted to that stronger than expected manufacturing data it's bumped up bond yields, been a bit of a defensive flight to mega cap tech, something we've been seeing for a little while now, and a bump up in commodities. While the yield sensitive sectors came off, and we can see that with the Magnificent 7 as a group actually finishing up 0.52% today when the rest of the main US market indices finished lower. And S&P was only down 20 basis points, but we got a little bit of a bump up here in volatility to start the quarter off up 5% to 13.6. Same with a little bump up in volatility risk premium. Strong rally up across the bond yield curve. Two year finishing up seven and a half basis points to 471 and the 10 year popping up 10 basis points. Now just sitting above 430 looking to come back and test that resistance zone. And so we saw a bit of weakness in the bond market today. There's TLT falling 2% and quite a sizable move for high yield bonds as well. Normally a low volatility market closed down pretty swiftly today, just under 1% on volume, lost its 50 day VWAP. And it'll be interesting to see if we come down to this support zone 
whether that can hold because if high yield bonds lose their footing, that's not good sign for risk assets, growth assets, as whenever there's a risk on sediment across markets, normally we see high yield bonds, which are the riskiest of bonds to the high risk borrowers. That's why they offer the highest yield to compensate for that risk. If they fall apart, that's not good for the stock market, nor is a rising dollar, which we've actually got coming up and pushing right against some recent resistance as well. Strong dollar is not good for stocks. There's Bitcoin still just consolidating below $70,000 a coin. But what stole the show today was gold breaking out to all time highs. And I've got to say, we're clearly in a gold bull market and just the lack of participation and enthusiasm around this commodity is telling me we still potentially have room to run further. And it's interesting because on some measures, it's already outperforming the S&P 500 lately, and it's got some strong tailwinds at play, supported directly by record purchases from central banks around the world, diversifying their reserves, especially the Chinese. They've been buying up gold big time. And even though normally lower yields help gold, because bonds kind of compete for investor dollars like gold does, gold doesn't offer a yield. So typically high yields makes gold less attractive. Even though we've had bond yields rally today, it's interesting to see gold rally as well. And it's still yet to be seen whether the Fed can cut in June or not. We got the Fed's preferred gauge of underlying inflation coming as expected while the market was shut on Friday. Core PCE rising 2.8% year over year. We heard from Jay as well, and he sounded maybe a little hawkish against his recent dovish tone of language. Like maybe he's looking at some data that's making him think twice about inflation coming down to his so-called 2% target. Not only that, we've got crude breaking out as well, and that's due to a couple of reasons. We are seeing a more aggressive and offensive Israel and Ukraine. After overnight, we just got news, Israel bombing an Iranian embassy in Syria and actually killing some Iranian commanders, and which is no doubt got to get a response from Iran, who have for years openly called for the elimination of the Jewish state known as Israel. They're not going to be happy with this one. Last time Trump killed Iranian's top military commander, Iran responded by firing missiles at a US base in the Middle East. And since this time is coming from Israel, things could be about to heat up to a new level. Not only that, we've got Ukraine more on the offense as well. Also here and overnight, they just downed two Russian drones. This is on top of recent attacks coming out of Ukraine towards Russian oil assets, trying to target their key source of revenue. And so even though the US-led Western alliance is back in Israel, back in Ukraine, that's only up to a certain point. Like I said, it's always in the interest of traditional politicians, along with their industrial military complex friends, to keep wars going around the world as they can keep laundering our tax dollars into their own pockets. However, they don't want it to spill over too much or into World War III or cause oil to rise and thus hurt the Biden's administration's chances of re-election. And so the US is trying to push back and urging Israel to dial it down and stop ramping things up, which Israel seems pretty keen on doing. They've actually backed out of diplomatic meetings with the US, gone out on their own, so to speak, while still leaning back on the Western support. US diplomats are also trying to urge Ukraine to dial it down, stop attacking Russian oil refineries, stop trying to escalate things and tempting Putin to push his big red button and turn this regional war into a potential global war involving nuclear weapons. So that's a big part of the bullish case for commodities, like we've seen in the past, in the 1970s, geopolitical tensions rise, correlates with inflation and the rise in commodity stocks, and typically interest rate cuts are a tailwind for commodities as well. Not only that, but a big part of why markets can move really hard and fast comes from the largest participants, that's institutional money. And they're the most underweight commodities relative to bonds since 2008 financial crisis. And the reason why large investors, and I'd say small investors as well, looking at Google search trends for gold related search terms, are so underweight on commodities and gold, it's because they've outperformed for as long as many people have been in the market. So all they've known is high growth stocks, tech stocks, outperforming commodities, small caps, value stocks. And so looking at the relative valuation of commodity prices, S&P 500, we're down near record lows. And that could lay for fertile ground for a huge rip. Once money, small and large, inevitably comes back into this space. On top of geopolitical tensions, central bank buying, depressed relative valuations, we've also got actual demand for commodities picking up as well. We can see that the latest manufacturing data we got out of the States today, with the PMI gauge getting above 50, first time in 17 months. The economy is not only holding up, showing signs of accelerating. Also, the world's second largest economy, China, is showing a bit of a rebound in their factory activity as well, with their manufacturing PMI also breaking out to a 13-month high getting back into expansion territory as well. And these two data points are also likely helping 
the commodity market rally up today as China, along with the US, the two biggest consumers of oil. And this comes at a time when we're talking about rate cuts as well. It's kind of crazy, isn't it? But that's why a lot of you guys know something I've been talking about for a couple of months now is there is the potential for a resurgence in inflation. All the ingredients are there. Strong economy, record low unemployment, record government consumer spending, geopolitical tensions, got the price action and commodities ripping higher. It'd be surprising if we don't see more inflation around the corner. And that's why the bond market's been confused actually trading up today, going against the grain of Fed rate cut expectations. And what could be a sign to Jay Powell that he might be a little bit too early in talking about rate cuts. And maybe he's recognizing that as well after hearing him speak on Friday. And so even though S&P 500 started off a little soft today, first trading day of the second quarter, we've still got the most risky end of the stock market, meme stocks, call options, and retail investor sediment participation near record highs. We can see that with retail net purchases of leveraged equity ETFs approaching those late 2021, early 2022 levels. And there had been good reason for that, largely thanks to the AI boom, which is still ongoing. We heard that today with Microsoft planning a $100 billion AI data center. That's a huge investment. That's a lot of money. It's going to have a lot of halo effects on from that. And so definitely the spending in AI is real. It is there. And it's a bit of a changing in the guard of the market. Some people say the Magnificent 7 are now the Fab 4 because Apple and Tesla have fallen by the wayside and the AI boom and those companies that really dominate that space are stepping out way in front in terms of stock price performance. And kind of in between, but I would say catching up quickly, is Alphabet Google. who recently partnered with Apple, allowing them to use their Gemini chatbot with iPhones in the future. And for those of you who watch the show every day, you remember last week I said Alphabet Google's primed for a breakout to all-time highs, and that's what we got today. Up over 3%, the best performing mega cap tech stock, and looking at my fundamental indicators, still reasonably valued, fair value, only 24% below. However, given its dominance in search and video, and likely going to be a big player in AI, I'd say it well and truly deserves a 24% premium over fair value. So I'd still call Alphabet a fairly valued stock, a lot more so than I would for Apple. With my fair value down at $106 a share, now looks to have gone into a downtrend. Apple's no longer a growing business anymore. They're going to have to work hard to retain the huge base of sales that they already have. And we could be testing this 168 support that we bounced off earlier last month, potentially in the next coming days. Same deal with Tesla. It's technically weak and I've got fair value around 125 a share. And I'd say it does deserve a bit of a premium given its brand strength. So I'd probably put fair value somewhere around 150. However, shareholder yield is negative and that's not a good sign either. However, that's the top end of town, which is a little split as I just showed you. What's really rocking in this market is the small end of town and meme stocks. I had a few IPOs recently and it's kind of crazy to see a former US president, now the largest shareholder in the latest meme stock, that's Trump Media. It's kind of amazing given all his recent legal troubles. He was actually able to get this deal done and skyrocket his wealth to all-time highs. And this is going to be quite the entertaining and interesting ride to watch this year in the market. It's definitely going to be one of the top stories, Trump media, and how it influences the election and thus by extension, all financial markets, global markets, geopolitics. This has knock-on effects to everything. And mainstream media are going to be coming after him hard and fast. They don't want to see him make billions and billions of dollars jumping onto the meme stock craze. And for sure, Trump Media Financials, like a lot of meme stocks, aren't that great at all. However, the stock price performance and the business performance, as we all know very well, can be two very different things. And the business is tiny, only 4.1 million of revenue last year. And the company does have aspirations to become a big media player and could have potential since over half of the country are Trump supporters and there is a big void in the market for more right-wing media, as has been proven most of the mainstream media and large tech companies, social media are left-leaning. And that's something Elon Musk has been trying to do with Twitter X as well. However, for now, we're gonna see the big mainstream media outlets come after Trump, keep it nice and entertaining for us financial market observers. And so we'll keep seeing headlines like this. Trump media stock is almost certain to crash with all the references to his net worth. And no doubt, not only will he have his opposition from the media, but also in the actual market, short sellers, are probably going to have a stab at this because there is room based on the underlying business financials for the stock to have an incredible amount of volatility and incite fear into holders of the stock, many of whom are just buying it in support of Donald Trump. And if he weren't to win the election, this stock would probably crash hard. If he does win, it could rally hard. And so you could kind of think of ticker DJT as a proxy for the odds of Trump winning an election. And this has got everyone's eyes on it. Even former billionaire bonking Bill Gross is trading DJT. With him tweeting a few days ago, a genius can have a high IQ 
or invest in the stock market during a bull market. A genius can also be an investor with the courage to sell DJT options at a 250 annualized volatility. And for those of you not familiar with options, what Bill Gross is implying here is he's selling volatility on Trump's stock, probably by selling a straddle or a strangle, as the options are implying 250% annualized movement. So that's huge. In comparison, S&P 500 options are implying about 15% annualized volatility. So Trump's stock volatility is trading about 15 times the market. And that's for good reasons as well. Even though it's got a market cap around 7 billion, a lot of the big option dealers are either not participating in this or they're asking really high implied volatilities to write premium because you could think of them as insurance companies selling stock market insurance. And this is going to be one of the most wild, crazy stocks this year. A lot of volume, a lot of participation. Who knows what's going to happen? Anytime Trump's involved, you know it's going to be entertaining. And so this thing could trade down to $10 a share. It could rip up to two, $300 a share in a crazy short spike. And that's why option dealers are asking huge premiums in order to write contracts on this. However, Bill Gross has gone the other way. He could be short both calls and puts at a 50 strike, or he could short a strangle by selling the 60 strike call and selling a 40 strike put. And so he'll make money if the stock doesn't move around too much in the coming weeks or month or however long expiry he's got. Most option sellers sell a month or two out. So if the stock price kind of just consolidates, then those option sellers will clean up. However, if the stock were to spike big up or down, then he'll take a loss on those contracts that he's written. And speaking of billionaires, we got to hear from Ken Griffin. He's the owner of Seidel, one of the largest market makers in the world. You trade on Robinhood, this is the guy on the other side of your trades. And so speaking recently, he gave his views on the economy and what he sees on the horizon. And some of those highlights coming from Ken were that he anticipates a medium term economic landscape that will remain challenging due to both structural and cyclical factors. Focusing on the states, we expect a more favorable climate for fixed income markets as inflation eases. Economic growth is likely to be modest, staying below potential in the upcoming quarters, with the central bank persisting in its fight against inflationary pressures. The surge in US public debt is a growing concern that cannot be overlooked. And he finished off by saying he aspires to create the most formidable team in the history of hedge funds. So that's a bit of a balanced outlook, nothing too dramatic there. It's kind of always sitting in the middle end. And to him, it doesn't even really matter what markets do because he always runs what's known as a delta neutral book. It doesn't matter which way the market goes, he'll make money. He's capturing the spread and sitting on both sides. He actually did really well in 2020 COVID. As his profits correlate more with volume, the more people that are buying and selling, the more volume that is traded each day, the more he takes a little slice out of all of that. Moving on to economic data we got today, there's a manufacturing PMI for the states going back into expansion territory above 50. Looking out tomorrow, we've got some European PMIs, German inflation data, JOLTS job openings from the states. Going into Wednesday, Inflation data coming out of the Eurozone, services PMIs from the States, a few Fed speakers into Thursday, imports and exports from the States along with a few more Fed speakers, and the big one, Friday. First Friday of the month, we always get a look at the jobs market, non-farm payrolls, and the unemployment rate expected to come in at 3.9% like it did last month. And look at that, this Fed funds futures market starting to think twice about the Fed cutting in June. And this is something we've been seeing all year. Them just pushing it out, pushing it out. It was recently 75% chance they were going to cut in June. Now it's approaching 50-50 after that strong manufacturing data we got today. And like I said, the more hot economic data prints we get, the more Jay Powell will have to come in again and do another about face on what he's been talking about. Because with risk assets ripping to all-time highs, unemployment record lows, spending, manufacturing, the economy, inflation, all hot. There's just no excuse for cutting rates. It'll look too much of a political maneuver and he'll cop too much blowback. On top of almost guaranteeing, we'll see a big resurgence in inflation. And who knows, it's possible we don't get any rate cuts this year. And given the strength in the economy, momentum in the market, government spending going into the election, stock market could still rip higher, regardless of what's going on in the bond market. And we can see that price action in the S&P 500, even though the bond market has repriced this last couple of months. It initially thought we're going to get six cuts this year. Now it's looking lucky if we even get three cuts. Stock market still continued. This parabolic rise doesn't even really care. Nor does it really care about geopolitical tensions and the increase in inflation expectations. It's kind of resilient to all of that for now. That's why the greed index is still at 73 and looks like it wants to go back into extreme greed. Corporate Insider is not doing any trading at all recently. And just finishing out with a few charts. There's a look at Junior Gold Miners, one of my top 10 ETF picks this year. Looking pretty good technically here. We've got trend strength going back to positive, breaking out higher highs, higher lows. Really nice move up in uranium nuclear energy today. 
Coming back up to test this resistance zone, and this is a market that's been ranging for a few months now, and markets don't stay ranging forever. This base could be setting up for a nice epic breakout after being one of the best performing commodities last year as well. And cannabis shaping up good as well. I can see the trend strength just coming back to neutral, ready to go positive again, potentially setting up for a nice breakout from these early February highs as well. And there's a look at Reddit, a lot of volatility in this stock as well. No doubt it's gonna bounce up and down for a while. Super micro computer kind of just plateauing. Micro strategy pulling back a bit here. AMC just looks left for dead. Surely this stock's going to zero. They just did another massive equity offering last week. And just like GME, if it wasn't for the meme stock craze and mania back in 2021, where they did a lot of secondaries and offered stock and selling stock to the market, replenishing their balance sheets, they'd already be dead now. And so it's kind of funny to see the meme stock traders actually keep them alive, but most likely just kicking the can down the road another couple of years. And there's Wingstop holding up with Abercrombie and Fitch reclaiming its 50 day VWAP as well. All right, guys, there we have it for the first trading day of the second quarter. 2024. Interesting developments underneath the hood and across markets. S&P 500 looks to be retaining this tight channel upwards. And it'll be interesting to see what we get this Friday with the jobs market, non-farm payrolls and unemployment rate. Bonds are already moving up. Commodities moving up. Inflation expectations moving up. Stock market continues to hold up in the face of all that. But something's eventually going to have to knock it over. Thanks very much for sticking with me and supporting Click Capital. I appreciate all you guys clicking that like button, dropping a comment. And if you haven't already, think about hitting that subscribe button as I make these videos every day after market close. And I'll be back same time tomorrow. Cheers.